Good morning, Shang Wei. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Welcome to the fourth episode of Making Reproductive Longevity a Reality. I'm Jennifer Garrison. I'm a faculty member at the Buck Institute and the faculty director for the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. So at the consortium, we want to alter the societal balance towards equality for women. And to do that, we want to understand what leads to menopause and enable um, scientists to discover interventions to slow or reverse it. So this webinar is designed to highlight some of the research that we funded. And today we're featuring two talks from GCRLE grantees on a really important topic related to female reproductive aging, and that is developing novel model systems. So I think a lot of people may not realize, Zhang Wei, that laboratory mice, which are the major model that we use, they do show de decreased reproductive capacity with aging, but they don't go through a true menopause like humans. Um, and so you must run into this in your, uh, uh, in your practice with your female patients. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, my research focuses on unraveling the biology of ovarian follicle genesis to understand, you know, why these follicles die off, you know, and, and trying to find the right model to really understand this phenomenon is really technically challenging in women. Um, you know, to get the human ovaries, you have to go through a general anesthetic, go through a surgery, just even take the ovaries, and there's ethics involved. And even getting ovarian follicles and eggs to study from, you know, women undergoing assisted reproductive techniques is actually very, very difficult and they are rare commodities to say the least yeah yeah i mean uh and especially when you're you're able to get that precious tissue um it's usually not healthy right and oftentimes it's quite difficult women want to hold on to their healthy tissue as it turns out <laughs> oh, absolutely absolutely i think i think we need we need some model organisms that can help us understand what the biological phenomenon are and to really investigate on how we can actually you know study what makes reproductive longevity a reality as what we're talking about today Right, and we'll hear later on in a different webinar um, from one of our grantees who's using a non-human primate model, but those are so precious and so rare. Um, there's a huge need to, to develop other models where you can study larger numbers of, of uh, animals. So um, I am delighted to introduce our first speaker. Her name is Berenice Benayoun. She is an assistant professor at uh, the University of Southern California of Gerontology and Biological Sciences at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. Um, and Berenice, she began her career in this field, believe it or not. She earned her PhD at the Institut Jacques Menard in Paris, studying the genetics of mammalian ovarian aging. Then she moved to Stanford University for her postdoctoral work, studying functional genomics of organismal aging. Um, and now in her own lab, her research focuses on leveraging big data to uncover mechanisms that drive aging with a focus on the differences between males and females during vertebrate aging. And an important new direction in her lab is to understand the impact of menopause on the aging process. Now, Berenice and our other speaker today, Ingrid, are both um, some of our junior uh, faculty awardees. And so they are just at the stage where they've, they've started their labs, they're hiring people, they're just getting going on their projects. And I would say they're at their most creative. Um, so. Today, uh, Berenice is going to tell us about some really exciting work she's doing to establish a mouse model of menopause that's actually relevant to human menopause. So, welcome, Berenice. Uh, and uh, let me say, oh, sorry, just let me remind people, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we'll answer them together during the discussion at the end. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for the really kind in introduction uh, and, you know, through through the GCRLE for, for allowing us to, to work on this really cool project that I really wanted to get going even before the GCRLE was there, but uh, we wouldn't have been able to get it started. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to explain why um, I believe we need age relevant models of menopause, what that means, uh, and also the, the beginning of our efforts. And obviously, we're still very early in the project, but at least give you guys an idea of what we are um, trying to do and, and how. So uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I, I'm very interested in the idea of how people age and why people age and what drives functional decline with age in general. And this is something to which we generally consider everyone to be equal in front of aging. We all age. Uh, we, we all experience some amount of functional decline with age. But um, one thing that's very often overlooked is that aging is not actually that 
uh, equal uh, in, in women are men and um, females are males when we're talking about other species. So this is a relatively recent uh, graph from, from the, the, the NIH on the um, life expectancy um, that you expect for, for male, men and women. And this is something I think people are vaguely aware of, that um, females tend to outlive men by about 10 years. And that's, again, something that would make you seem that women tend to age better. But actually, after the age of menopause, which in uh, developed countries around 51 years uh, of age, um, the, the health of women is actually generally uh, less good than that of age match uh, men. And so there's a lot to understand about how um, menopause can affect health in general. And of course, there is an effect on reproduction, uh, but the effect on the general health of, of the body is also very uh, important. Uh, and despite the fact that we know there are such huge differences, the, the majority of the field still insists on doing the majority of studies in only males. And there's a, a lot of reasons that are given, like, oh, it's too complicated to look at uh, both sexes, or female data is so noisy, or, oh, females are just males with hormones. Uh, none of which are, like, very, very good reasons to, to not look. And, and because of that, we are actually very... Um, very much in the dark about the differences at the molecular mechanistic level uh, between males and females as they age. However, we do know from over 15 years of data now that anything that improves lifespan, generally, at least in rodents, do, does so in a sex dimorphic manner. We know that there's huge differences in the fact our genes are regulated um, in, in females and male tissues. We know that there are things that are very different in terms of disease profile, and that includes immunity. Uh, autoimmune disease are extremely frequent in women compared to men, nine to one ratio. And I'm sure everyone has heard that COVID-19 actually hits uh, men a lot harder than women. And so understanding those differences can in the end help everyone because we could bring um, the, the sex that has worse outcomes to the level uh, of the other one. And so, uh, as I mentioned, menopause is actually one of those critical times in a woman's life where things are going to happen that are going to accelerate functional decline. So this is just a graph that I pulled uh, from the internet showing all of the systems that are known to be affected uh, by menopause. That includes uh, the brain. P people think that uh, there, the huge increase in neurodegenerative disease in postmenopausal women might be actually driven uh, by the depletion of, of uh, of hormones, uh, there's change in the skin quality, uh, risk of heart damage, osteoporosis, a lot of side effects of menopause in addition um, to, to um, reproduction. And so if we measure things, so pe people always kind of ask, well, you know, men also have declines in hormones, and this is evidently very important, but it occurs much later in age, usually after the age of 75. So there's not as much of a life post uh, or hormonal decline. Uh, and, and so, you know, when you think about it in, in terms of the impact of estrogens for women, there's going to be two very important um, sort of timelines uh, of the menarche, the first period, and then the menopause. And this is when the uh, exposure to estrogens, again, with all the positive effects uh, on health is going to be. And basically, the capital of health that was gained before menopause has to be there and kept for the rest uh, of life. And that includes, for instance, bone density, which cannot really be recovered um, after uh, menopause. So with all of that, those lifelong um, disparities, it's, it becomes really important to understand what happens, how, and can we do anything taking into account the fact that older women are going to have this depletion to improve health. And so this is where the question of actually being able to study menopause and its impact in a common laboratory model becomes very important. Uh, and that's why um, we probably need to have better models. Um, as again, J Jennifer mentioned, Post menopause is actually extremely rare in the animal kingdom. Uh, it has evolved a couple times in isolated uh, manners, in generally in species that have a very long uh, time to sexual maturity. And so that includes a couple of uh, whale species, 
of course, humans and very few, uh, actually they're not even represented here, very few species uh, of uh, monkeys. And although menopause can be partially defined by a very long post-reproductive um, lifespan, it also has some hormonal impacts that are not quite recapitulated in other species. And this is just to show you how um, the age at death and the age at la that where the last life birth is possible, how humans really are uh, outliers there. And, and that makes it really important for us to understand what's going on, again, for health, for reproduction, for, for all of these uh, phenomena. So I'm going to try to, to explain why even the models we have right now aren't great. So if you think of, again, humans, this is a very schematic way of looking at what's going on hormonally uh, in early reproduction. So that would be uh, right about after first period, then, you know, reproductive lifespan and then uh, menopause. So in purple here, you have the average estrogen levels, which are the main, you know, female hormones that are relatively high. And of course, there are monthly uh, cycles throughout life um, that are going to occur and, and lead to periods of high exposure to estrogen and low exposure to estrogens. That is going to be, in general, again, on average, accompanied by relatively low levels of a hormone produced by the brain that is called FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, which basically tells the ovary, okay, you need to ovulate. Uh, uh, basically. So it regulates the frequency at which uh, women can be fertile in general. And so the cyclicity is not great at the beginning of the reproductive lifespan, then it becomes more regular. Again, we're speaking generally. But then what happens when you get towards the age of menopause for about 10 years prior, you enter a stage that's called perimenopause, where the cyclicity starts being um, more and more erratic the estrogen levels tend to change a lot more dramatically than they used to. And then there's also a progressive increase of that FSH. And people believe that it's because the, the ovary is not responding as it should. And so the brain is trying to tell the ovary to produce you know, more, and it's not. Uh, and this culminates, again, at around 51 years of age with actual menopause where estrogen levels drop to almost undetectable levels. Uh, cyclicity is lost uh, and you have very high FSH uh, levels. And that occurs in uh, women, again, that are about two thirds uh, into their life expectancy. Um, and so that are already, uh, you know, in the middle of uh, great physiological changes compared to early um, adulthood. In mice, which is again, like the most currently used model to understand aging and its uh, impact uh, in mammals, uh, when you let the mice age normally, this is where you can see things are going to be different. Um, estrogens do decline a little bit um, with, with age, but not that much. Um, the, there are still very much detectable estrogens in older uh, animals in, in mice. The FSH does increase, but not dramatically. And yes, the, the, the cyclicity um, um, wanes. And by the time they're about 16 months of age, um, just to give you an idea, that would be that would be the equivalent of like maybe a 75 year old woman. No, maybe 70 year old woman. Then you know um, they're um, acyclic and uh, they're on a state that's called estropause, but not menopause. But they do not really have a transition like humans do. And so, in the classical ways of studying menopause. Uh, because people hate having to age mice because it takes time uh, and it's expensive, uh, people usually are going to study these things in younger mice, about three months old, which would be the equivalent of studying menopause in 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 women, which in most cases is, is not the most relevant um, milieu to study it in. The first model, which um, is very poor in terms of recapitulating the hormonal uh, impact of menopause, is just straight up ovariectomy. Uh, so it's a surgery, you remove the ovaries, and that's definitely going to completely destroy production of estrogens. That is going to lead to an increase in FSH and a loss of cyclicity. Uh, but contrary to um, humans, where the perimenopause, that transition period, actually lasts years, and it's actually when women experience the most side effects of menopause, the hot flashes and all of this, this is going to be immediate from one day to the next. So you have a very abrupt change. It's usually done in very young animals. Um, and 
Also, the thing that is completely ignored is that the postmenopausal ovary in humans produces a lot of androgens, so the male uh, preference or hormones, that, the, uh, that if you remove that ovary, you do not get that. So you lose a lot of the, the physiological relevance. And so some people have tried to find things that at least recapitulate a transitional period. And that includes a model that we are sort of tweaking uh, which is in injection with a chemical called v VCD, which is a, an environmental toxicant, uh, which when you expose uh, mice to it for 15 days, um, for some reason there is a very specific um, effect on the ovary where the, uh, the, the, the follicles get activated and then uh, commit mass suicide or uh, in a process that's called follicular atresia. And that occurs over a course of about 100 days. So you have a transitional period. And during that transitional period, you have wide changes in estrogen levels. You do have a progressive increase in FSH and you have a progressive loss of cyclicity. So this is a better model already than ovariectomy. ovariectomy. Uh, but the problem is again, um, as far as we've seen in the literature, this model has only ever been used in very young animals, two to three months of age. Uh, and so that's a problem again, because menopause does not occur in general for the majority uh, of, of uh, women uh, before very uh, advanced mid age. Uh, so again, this is the distribution uh, of the age at, at menopause. Menopause occurred, occurs in middle-aged women, which are going to have already increased inflammation, already decreased function in, in a lot of systems. So what are we doing to try to model that age relevance and those transitional periods and all of this? Uh, so we are pursuing three different models, and we're hoping at least one of them will make it, although we are, uh, we, we are very... Um, uh, cautiously optimistic that all three are going to um, bring us complementary information. The first one being just using that VCD um, um, chemical that I mentioned, but instead of doing it in very young animals, do it in older animals. And so this is actually the, the only data I'll have to, to show you in, in this um, uh, in this presentation that's come from our lab, where we've done tests where we started the VCD at five months of age, which is already uh, much older than it has ever been reported in the literature. Um, and, and then we let them age for the 100 days to see what, what would happen, and then study what's going on in their ovaries and also hormonally. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you aren't familiar with ovarian histology, but let me just point you to a certain number of things that show us that something like uh, menopause is occurring. So you can see in this column, we have example of uh, ovaries from two VCD animals and here from two control animals. And so those little stars that you see are every time we could detect a follicle. And so follicles are what uh, contain the oocytes. And so that's what uh, allows a prolonged um, reproductive lifespan. And so you can see there's a lot of them in both these animals. Whereas like in the VCD animals, we detect less than uh, five uh, uh, follicles in either animal here uh, very clearly. We also, and I don't have the slide here, but we also see an eightfold increase in circulating FSH, uh, suggesting they are experiencing that dramatic increase in FSH like uh, women with menopause uh, experience. And so altogether, this really uh, looks like we have created something like menopause with ovaries that have been depleted uh, of those follicles, but that are still going to be able to produce androgens like the postmenopausal ovary. We do have um, endocrine markers that are consistent with menopause. And so we believe this, this is going to be very promising. And so right now, ongoing, we've started the process at uh, different ages. So five months, uh, but also eight and 10 months, uh, because we can see, we, we want to see if we can actually see an effect of age at menopause, which is actually a very well-known um, predictor of overall all women's health. Uh, and then in addition to this model, we're also pursuing um, genetic models. And so the first one is actually inspired from my uh, PhD work uh, that, um, that was mentioned where we, I, I worked on the genetics of menopause in humans. Uh, and so it turns out that um, the gene I was working on called FOXL2, uh, when it's mutated in humans, you, um, you actually have premature menopause for about half of the patients and it's depending on where the mutation is. Uh, and it's 
uh, dominant. So it means you only need to have the mutation on one of the copies of the genes you received, either from your mom or your dad, and it's enough to lead to that premature menopause. Um, and so in mice, that, mouse, that gene exists, and it's actually been um, studied for the full mutation where two copies are mutated, but those mice are really, really messed up when they don't have FOXL2 at all. 95% um, of them die within a week of birth. Uh, but in deep in the paper where, where that, those mice were described, they actually say, oh, we noticed that the, the mice that had one missing copy and one good copy actually still had subfertility, sub they, they had some problems, but you know they didn't study it more than that. It's like two lines uh, in the material and methods uh, of the paper. Uh, but if you look here for the still very young animals for the full knockout, uh, this is histology of the ovary. You can see here for the wild type, nice, uh, follicle with a little oocyte here, uh, but the, the FOXL2 ovary is um, com completely uh, different looking uh, and the, the follicles are dying. And so that uh, makes us believe that st studying that half mutant, that heterozygote, is going to give us something uh, that might be reminiscent of the early menopause uh, in humans observed for people who have a mutation in this gene. Uh, and so we, we've actually started to age those mice to see uh, when they will start uh, acquiring those menopause-like uh, phenotypes. So that's the, first, uh, that's the first of the genetic model. And then the second genetic model is sort of more of a sure thing, uh, because historically, um, it has been described as recapitulating a lot of um, menopause phenotypes uh, in, in mice. Uh, and it's the deficiency for a key gene that's associated to that uh, communication between the brain and the ovary. And so you may remember I mentioned this hormone called FSH, uh, which is very important in the signaling for menopause in, in humans. Uh, and it turns out that um, the receptor for it, if it's half gone, um, people reported that mice develop menopause-like symptoms by seven to nine months of age, which is uh, really close to mid-age and so potentially a good model. And this is just some more histology showing you lots of follicles, not enough, and then uh, decrease in reproductive success. So we think this is gonna be really um, uh, powerful. And so with all of these, uh, we plan on looking at the ovaries and um, utilizing genomics to look at the single cell, what's going on in all those ovaries while they're undergoing menopause figuring out which are the cell types that are there, how they're being affected by the process uh, at the moment where you have the transition to menopause. And this will allow us for each of those cell types to understand how menopause is affecting them and hopefully uh, comparing to available data in humans, figure out which one of these uh, best recapitulates human menopause and could be used to better understand the, um, the, the, the way women age uh, using mice models. And um, we do believe this will help improve the health of all. And so I'm just gonna thank notably the GCRLE for making the work possible, all the members of my lab and, and you for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice, that was awesome. Um, we'll save the questions till the end. Please put them into the Q&A box. Zhang Wei? Yes, so now it's my turn. Thank you, Bernice. I think uh, it was exciting and I was having so many questions myself, but I'll hold them on because now I'm going to introduce uh, Ingrid. Ingrid Fetter-Pruneda is an assistant professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Una, Mexico City. She is interested in using ENDS to identify genes and cellular mechanisms involved in regulating the co-occurrence of high fecundity and longevity. Her goal is to provide insights into how reproductive senescence could be prevented or reverse in less fecund species. I think that is actually very interesting to me because I practice IVF as well. Uh, so please, Ingrid, let's listen to what you have to share. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my presentation. And I'm very happy to show you why ants are really very cool organisms to study uh, fertility. So, um, but first I'm gonna tell you, I mean, we have seen these graphs before but the female reproductive system is unique among our organ systems because it shows functional decline decades earlier than other organ systems. And this is characterized by a decline in gamete um, quantity, but also an increase in poor quality of, of oocytes. And this leads to menopause. 
And we know that, or we have discussed in this series, that uh, menopause has really uh, big impact, a big impact in, in female health. Um, so the big question um, is to try to understand why the female um, reproductive system ages earlier, no? Um, so uh, we, we also saw these graphs before during the seminar series. And um, here one shows that uh, life expectancy has increased a lot um, in the centuries, whereas age of menopause has remained constant uh, on average. And this other graph also shows that life expectancy um, correlates with the age at which menopause occurs. So um, one of the big questions is to understand what triggers this premature aging of the ovaries. And um, there have been uh, lots of efforts to study reproductive aging in model systems. And these model systems include worms, uh, mice, and fruit flies. And they have been, um, one of the main reasons that they have been used for lab research is that they have very short lifespan and a lot of experimental tools have been developed to study them. However, the fact that they have very low, uh, very low lifespans in the case of, particularly in the case of C. elegans and fruit flies, um, make it uh, not great as model systems for aging because humans have actually very long lifespans. So, and also human aging is affected by our social environment. So, uh, an, an alternative would be studying non-human primates, which have a uh, long lifespan and also um, a more enriched social environment. However, performing experiments in tons of, of, of non-human primates is very complicated. So we need alternative model systems um, to, that have long lifespans and that are easy to study in the lab. And that's why I think ants are an incredible new model system, an exciting model system to study aging. Um, because um, I, I'll tell you why. So, so why, why, why study ants? So ants are critical model systems uh, to, to study reproductive aging and to develop as reproductive aging uh, models. Because first of all, they live really long, or they can live real long. They are social, and we can study lots of them at once. And being social has been um, associated with an increase in longevity in, in insects. Normally, insects don't live long. But um, if they are social, like termites, which are the first group uh, shown here, uh, ants, which is the second group shown here in red, and, or, or bees, they, they have really extended lifespans. And, and this, is, this correlates with the fact that they are uh, highly social. And these social uh, insects can live like decades uh, compared to, to, to the solitary species that only live um, months or up to months. Uh, so, so, um, so it's like living hundredfold longer than a solitary uh, insect. That, that would mean like, I don't know, like a human could live 8,000 years instead of, of only 80. Um, and ants are very exciting because they're, they're extremely diverse. Um, it's not only the ones, the tiny ones I showed you before that are pests in your house, but they are like in all shapes and colors they come. And there are more than 15,000 species of ants. And, and they are, just as they show this incredible morphological diversity that you're seeing here in the slide, they also show incredible and very complex social behavior and also incredible different ways of reproducing. So what do I mean by having really complex social behavior? Well, they build ama amazing nests. Um, this is a nest of an ant um, that, that was filled with, with plaster. And you can see different chambers in it and tunnels, and even it has ventilation. And it resembles just like a construction made by, by humans, right? Uh, or at least to me, a little bit. And this, for instance, is another example of leafcutter ants. Uh, and a nest of a leafcutter ant. And it also has like tons of chambers and tunnels that connect the different chambers. And you can have hundreds of thousand ants living in these uh, incredibly complicated structures. And 
even more surprising is that these ants, the leaf cutters, have chambers where they grow their own where they grow their own food. So when you see the, the, the leaf cutter ants cutting uh, leaves, it's not that they're gonna eat the leaves, but actually they use those leaves to feed the fungus that they grow in those chambers and they actually feed on the fungus. This white thing here on the right is the fungus that they actually eat, no? So ants have developed agriculture uh, way before humans had agriculture and that we know of are the only uh, two animals that have agriculture. And um, that they can achieve this kind of complex behaviors because they cooperate. So for instance, this is our weaver ants, which are arboreal ants that build their nests in trees and they hold together the leaves of, of, of the tree. And then after the, the, this is like in a shape where they will have actually the entire colony inside, they bring, um, they bring little, oh, sorry, they're young, they're larvae and the, the, these workers that have the young use the silk produced by the larvae to glue the leaves together. Um, so this is another example of how cooperation between organisms can achieve like really complex behaviors that are only or comparable to human behaviors. And um, so the fact that they are highly social uh, makes them very successful and they have a complex social structure as sophisticated as that find in humans. And the key aspects of this sociality in ants is that they display division of labor, cooperation, and communication. And perhaps the most remarkable or important feature of this division of labor is a reproductive division of labor. So here I'm showing you uh, the picture of um, an army ant from Costa Rica, and she is the queen, the big one is the queen and her workers. And queens, not only they differ in shape, as you can see here, queens are the ones in charge of reproducing and laying all the eggs, whereas the workers are in charge of taking care of the colony. And queens can be very long lived, as I told you, in some species they can live up to 30 years. And throughout that time, they remain extremely fertile. And they are a great system to study fertility in an organism that can live for really very long. Um, just to show you the ex most extreme example, this is an army ant from Africa, a driver ant from Africa. And uh, so this is the queen and her worker, and they're essentially, you could consider them with this, they have the same genome, yet their morphology is completely different, their lifespan is completely different, and their ability to reproduce is completely different. Seen from the side, you can see here her huge abdomen filled with uh, eggs and ovaries, whereas her, her daughter, who is in the bottom, is sterile and she cannot reproduce, right? So the mother uh, and the daughter, and these ants live in colonies that can have at the time 10 million ants, and all laid by, by a single queen. So they lay about 4 million eggs uh, per month. Um, I don't remember how many eggs uh, Carlos Rivero said Drosophila lays, but it was in the hundreds. So these ants can lay 4 million eggs in, 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 in one month. And here from the back of the end, you can see this white thing and those things are the eggs that she's constantly laying. And, and the workers, her daughters are just picking up those eggs and um, taking care of them. Um, so um, social insects, as like I hope I've shown you, present a unique opportunity to study the molecular and cellular mechanisms that allow the simultaneous occurrence of high fertility and a long life. Uh, like what um, we would observe in humans, but to take into an extreme. And moreover, I told you they were super diverse. There are more than 15,000 species, but they also have a diversity in the reproductive systems. So some have like fixed gas where you have only one queen um, or some queens, but they cannot change which one reproduces in the colony, but some are highly flexible. So for instance, in, in, in these Indian jumping ants, if the queen dies, the workers can fight between each other. And, and then one of them wins and activates ovaries and becomes the queen of the colony. But when this transition happens, it changes from a worker that would have lived for months, for just one month, a couple of months, to a queen that will live for years. 
No? So it's actually very flexible and super interesting to understand. So what could drive this increase in longevity and fertility? And, um, and there are other types of ants that have like a cyclic behavior that the same ant for two weeks behaves like a queen and for two weeks behaves like a worker. So we want to know what makes a queen. And I studied this um, during my postdoc. And, and we also want to know what allows for the co-occurrence of high fertility and longevity. So during my postdoc, uh, we, we wanted to know what's different between queens and workers. And we studied gene expression in the brains of seven different species that would represent the entire ant phylogeny to see what's common between queens or different between queens and workers. And when we did this study, we found one single gene that is always overexpressed in, in queens and, and low in workers. And this gene is insulin. And no surprise because it has been uh, appearing in, um, in a lot of aging studies and, and, and fertility studies, no? And in humans, we know that metabolism and reproductive longevity are linked, even in young women. And if they have uh, PICOs, they are more likely, for instance, to have metabolic dysfunction and diabetes. So I'm just, I, I learned this uh, or heard this during the, the seminar series, and I, I thought it was a nice uh, like link, you know, that in this case, insulin is what makes queens different from, from workers. And so uh, what is the role of insulin in ant reproduction? So to, to, to answer this question, I studied the clonal greater ant, which is an ant that is very easily uh, kept in the lab they reproduce by clonality and they have this basic, this cyclic behavior that I told you. So for two weeks, they behave like queens and then for two weeks, they behave like uh, workers. And this cycle is regulated by the presence of larvae. And uh, so we wanted to know what, are, what is happening. What, what are insulin levels also regulated by the larvae? So here I'm showing you how insulin changes when you remove larvae from colonies that, that have workers with larvae. And so the insulin levels go up and actually the ants transition into a queen-like state. And when you have um, queen-like uh, ants in the colony without larvae and you add larvae, then the insulin levels go down. And this also happens when, when you control for, for feeding or for, for, yeah, for feeding conditions. Insulin levels are, are high when there are no larvae and low when there are larvae. And um, we wanted to see if actually insulin had an effect in, in the ovaries, even in the presence of this inhibitory cue that comes from the larvae. And as you can see here, so we, what we did was we injected synthetic insulin, and these gorgeous structures, gorgeous structures here that I'm showing you are the ovaries of the ants, in case you had never seen one. And so when you inject them with insulin, uh, they have more active ovaries with larger oocytes, than when they are just in the presence of, of the larvae, which inhibit the ovaries and inject it with a control. Um, and, um, and this also correlates with feeding in these ants. So if you feed well uh, the colonies, you have more proportion of ants that have uh, larger ovaries and higher levels of insulin also that I'm not showing here. And, this reminds me of the talk by Carlos Ribeiro, where he mentioned the importance of nutrition and, and fertility. Um, and so insulin signaling is very important for longevity and fertility. Uh, it has been shown in different mold systems that it's involved in, in, in longevity and fertility, and it's also important for ants. However, ants ha are very exciting to study because they are social, they are very long lived, just as humans. Um, they are highly fertile, they keep their fertility for very long and they're easy to experiment with. So with the GCRLE funds that I got, I want to further develop these uh, well, ants small systems for fertility and longevity. And I want to find new genes involved in longevity by studying other tissues other, other than the brain, uh, also with a comparative approach, studying different ants uh, species. And then I want to nail down what these genes are doing. So for instance, in the case of insulin, where does insulin act in the brain and throughout the body? What's this brain-body connection as Holly Ingraham mentioned in, one of her, in her webinar? Um, is there a difference between queens and workers in the location 
where insulin acts within and between species, um, are, are there differences? And also if you change the social environment, are there differences in how insulin is acting? And finally, I would like to develop or devise strategies to extend the fertility and lifespan of other species with the knowledge gathered from, from, from ants. Uh, but that's in, in the long run. And I just want to end by acknowledging uh, people in my lab. My lab just started almost when the pandemic started, <laughs> but I'm really happy to have them in my lab and we have had great discussions. Uh, so people in my lab, the former people I worked with during my postdoc at Rockefeller University, also my collaborators, Jennifer Garrison, Deborah Gordon, and Anay Chavarria, and people from GCRLE, who have been super helpful uh, through this uh, grant and um, and of, of course the funding received by the GCRLE. And um, I'm currently looking for new postdocs and students, so if you're interested, contact me. Thank you so much. Right, thank you, Ingrid. Um, and, and these two talks from Ingrid and Veronis are actually fascinating, very fascinating to me. Uh, and there are already questions here um that uh you know i, I i'm so amazed um ingrid probably we should make all women queen right they yeah. all should be queens and treated like queens isn't it all should be like royalty <laughs> have the right royal food and then you know wow they all become super young super healthy right um so i have a question for Bernice first because we talk about menopause first now um uh, because in my research as well and i i do see that actually um in the postmenopausal ovary um there are still some follicles present, but you know they are just too too few to activate anything meaningful in, in the postmenopausal women, and 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 therefore I think there's a question here. I was asking, what is the definition then of a menopause mouse model? Is it by virtue of the hormone profile that I also see in a women, or or what are the health and lifespan changes uh, in the models that you're creating as compared to the control of the wild type? Excellent question. So right now, the way we are uh, approaching it, because I, I wish I could tell you it's been studied, but it really has not, mm -hmm. uh, is to try to mimic best what's going on at the ovarian level and at the hormonal level in, in humans. And, and based on epidemiological data in humans, we know that age at menopause is actually one of the best predictor of longevity in women, of longevity and health in women. And so obviously that's correlative, uh, but this is one of the reasons we're um, trying to induce menopause at different ages using that VCD model, uh, because chemically it's easier to, to play with that. Uh, and we believe there will be a direct relation with how long and how healthy th those mice uh, are going to live. But the, the quick answer is, we believe there will be an impact, but um, nobody knows yet. <laughs> right. Uh, that follows on um, because it, it links. So, so someone was asking um, that does VCD treated females actually ovulate multiple oocytes more than usual per cycle? Um, but I do remember you saying that it's due to you know, sudden activation and it all undergo rapid attrition. Tree yeah, so, so, you know, how did the, how did the depletion happen so rapidly, you know, uh, like menopause in this mind, how did it happen so quickly? So, um, for, for, again, like this is one of those things where people saw that it worked and they didn't necessarily go very deep in how it works. Mm. Uh, but it seemed that it has a, a tropism for the oocytes. So when right. you inj we inject it in the peritoneum of the, of the mice, uh, and there's no other effect that has been detected of this um, uh, of this chemical, and it was actually discovered because it was having um, reproductive effects on people who were exposed to it, human, uh, humans that were exposed to it. Right, right. Um, so it it goes to the oocytes and it leads to sort of an activation of the follicle, but those are not productive, so they don't get ovulated. It's just they they start growing, but then they, there is atresia. The oocytes um, die. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and all at once, basically. And so when you look at it at 100 days, that's when basically you've had like several waves of, of death uh, of oocytes, but you see there's still some that are there, just not many. And um, if you actually look, the majority of the ones that are left are stuck in the very early stage, like primordial or primary follicles. Right. Um, and so um, we think those are just too resistant to get out of that um, sort of sleep. Uh, state. I see. Right. So similar to what you see in in women, right? Because there are yes. uh, follicles; they're just dormant. 
Yeah, and, and, the, and when they become abnormal when she's postmenopausal, then then the gynecologist and me jump out and say, oh, that's not normal. You are now sick. You so why should you have a cyst in your ovary? Right, <laughs> that, that's exciting. Jennifer, any anything to contribute to to the discussion? Maybe any questions for Ingrid? Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a bunch of questions for Ingrid. So, um, let's see, uh, Ingrid, um, would you expect to find conserved genes or pathways between social insects like ants and mammals? Um, yeah, particularly, you know, any anything in particular? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, the fact that in, in mammals, insulin has also been shown to be important. Uh, I think it's already a good uh, sign. And in, in naked mole rats, uh, they have shown that the insulin pathway is also important and they also have extended life spans. Uh, so the fact that you've, you've discovered insulin as an important regulator of um, reproductive aging in um, ants suggests that you'll find something, you know, it suggests that this is a reasonable model system to continue with, right? I would think so because I'm, I'm really excited about it because actually they, are, they have long lifespans and we have very few models of invertebrate models that have actual long lifespans, you know, so if that's conserved, then Yes, definitely. And kind of related to that, um, and maybe contrasting a bit with mice and with um, higher vertebrates and mammals, um, how many individuals can you study at once? Like what's feasible to study in a lab? Um, what kind of numbers do you get? What kind of statistics do you get on those numbers? Huge numbers. I mean, we can have colonies with hundreds and hundreds, like in a little Petri dish, and study them under different social environments, under different nutritional conditions. We can even do CRISPR mutants. We can do transgenics in hundreds and can hundreds. You, can you um, explain for people who maybe don't know what CRISPR is, what, what you mean by that? Well, mutagenesis. We can uh, either knock out genes or knock in genes through a very novel, exciting um, tool. Uh, that allows to do that very fast and in many models, uh, in many organisms. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, 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 that brings me to another point because uh, I was also studying uh, women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, you know, this, this condition where the woman has lots of follicles, but she doesn't ovulate every month. And it seems to be related to the insulin signaling pathways. So, so that really pitched me because uh, I think Ingrid and maybe Berenice, you can also... Uh, uh, have a, have a mention because I was thinking, um, how does this insulin pathway actually, in what we see in, in the post uh, in the polycystic ovarian syndrome ladies, they seem to not produce an egg every month um, and they seem to have other metabolic problems and they become insulin resistant. Uh, but the, the, their oocytes seem to be still better quality because they're younger. And, and you know, in the, in the end, you know, she keeps producing healthy, you know, worker ants, worker daughters. You know, the fact of her being an old, old queen, she's still producing a viable colony. So do, do you have anything to do? Does it maintain the quality of the oocyte? Do you think at the same time, when it, when it maintains the longevity of the organism, you know, do you think it comes together? Yes. I, I mean, I don't know. In the case of ants, I mean, there are so many species that I'm sure there is variation, but, uh, but they... they they continue to be fertile and and all the way to the end of the colony life almost, you know? It's it's really incredible. And sometimes they even increase their out output uh, of eggs um, after the colony has reached certain size. But but I don't know, I don't think we know enough. Pro I mean, no one has really studied the quality of the eggs and if that changes. But Is at that some point- you're planning to look at? Yeah, it's interesting because at some point some species start producing actually queens or, or, or more, you know, or, or more males, which are uh, haploid, when they know they are about to die. So that's mm. interesting. Oh. Something changes and then the, the eggs are just haploid and they don't get fertilized. But I don't know yet much about it, but it would be super interesting to study it. Yeah, I wonder yeah. how they know they're about to die. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, 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 that brings the question off. Maybe that was, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, I have a question. There's a question for Berenice here that I think is really interesting. Um, so the physiology of females in general has been understudied, right? And maybe even purposefully, I would say excluded for, 
from research for decades. Um, it wasn't until like 2014 that the NIH, which is the largest granting, you know, the, the governmental granting institution in the US, um, required recipients to include both males and females in animal studies. So we basically have preclinical research spanning half a century that was conducted primarily in males. Um, so how do you think that that has impacted, you know, our understanding of um, reproductive aging in, in the female system? I mean, uh, uh, the, the, obviously very, very badly, uh, because again, like basically hormones have been seen as a problem and as something that you want to get away from, something noisy. This is actually not only... Um, not only in animals, I think one of the things that surprised me the most is when I learned that, and I think this is start, starting to change, but that the majority of phase one and phase two clinical trials are done almost exclusively uh, on men, uh, because again, the excuse is usually like, oh, we want to make sure there's not going to be any, um, you know, cross reaction with birth control, or what if the people in the trial get pregnant? And, and that's a problem because half of the recipients of any treatment or intervention are going to be women. Uh, and we have very little idea of how they respond to such uh, treatment and such drugs. Like, for instance, uh, we know, and that's so that's slightly outside of the reproductive uh, field, but the liver is actually one of the most different organs, you know, outside of the reproductive system between women and men or females and males, specifically in enzymes that uh, process and destroy drugs, which means drug metabolism and drug clearance times uh, between women and men are going to be very different. And all the dosing, um, you know, tests are done on men. And so I think generally that is um, detrimental to women's health you know, again, in general, but also specifically as it pertains to uh, the impact on reproduction or reproductive longevity, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and, mean, the, um, the, oh, hmm. go ahead. Jennifer, please go ahead. No, you go, Zhongwei. Yeah, because, <laughs> because when, when Berenice was talking about this, I was thinking about equality. Okay, I mean, um, you know, this, this, this whole thing is talking about equality. And, and, and absolutely, it's true, because um, when, when I was doing some trials and, and when we want to, like, has the drug safety, you know, we try to use it on men, you know, just to say that we protect our women. Uh, but but nowadays we have to change that narrative, isn't it, Jennifer? Like uh, we have to put it across like equality, like, you know, women are also equal standing. And what our video has started, you know, we want everybody to be on equal field, but there are some differences. We know there are differences, but let the differences be understood so that you'll be equal for both gender. And I think what Bernice have shared is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the whole thing, you know, uh, one of the things I, I like to point out is there's, you know, this buzz around the idea of personalized medicine, right? We're going to figure out that you have this one little difference in your genome. And because of that, we're going to adapt uh, medical treatment. And, you know, there's no bigger difference than an entire chromosome. Uh, and women and men have an entire chromosome difference. And so you would believe people would try to personalize medicine starting by that. That hasn't really been done. That's exactly right. And um, we made, you know, we talked about this a little bit more in a, an earlier uh, episode, but, um, you know, the, the idea that um, you know, there's just it, it, female reproductive aging is probably the most the most complicated. It's so complicated. Um, the most complex <laughs> Um, aspect of a woman's physiology that, um, you know, it's different at an individual level for every single person. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something I think that gets missed when we look at that, those sort of average graphs of the number of oocytes, you know, that's just on average, that's true. But at the level of the individual, there's so much stochasticity and there's so much variability that's happening um, in a woman's body. And, and that's what we have to get a handle on. Um, so there's one more question for Ingrid. Um, how do you envision your work translating to other organisms um, like mice or humans? That's a very challenging question, actually. I, 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 I just thought about uh, it the, the way I, I said it just before, a little bit like um, because they are long-lived, then we have higher chances to have things in common with other longer-lived species. So first, I would go trying to translate these into other insects, such as Drosophila, where we have tons of, um, of tools. 
And then from there, maybe into mice or something else, also with a lot of tools. But um, but if we could extend uh, fer fertility and, and longevity in Drosophila, would be a good start towards uh, transitioning whatever we find uh, into into possible um, treatments or I don't know how to say it. Yeah, treatments. Yeah, that that, that sounds really really nice. And and do do remember that. Uh, uh, the quality of uh, the wool sacs and fertility is very important. Like, uh, it, it, you know, I, I always think that it doesn't matter that you just have one, but you have one good one, uh, that makes all the difference, isn't it? Just have one good queen, <laughs> she makes the whole colony, isn't it? So, so I, I think I think it was so interesting to to get data from uh, various mice or so for your female mice that are undergoing that that you know that process of a loss of wool site and and you know as uh, Ingrid, you go and explore more about how to extend, you know. The productive lifespan, uh, the, the quality of this oocyte, that there must be something in them because in, in women, unfortunately, uh, I have I want to change the narrative. That's why I'm here, <laughs> uh, which is I, I can't tell that. Oh, as you get older, your eggs are getting, you know, very bad, and and I don't want to say this all the time. So so right. I'm eagerly waiting for that result. Um, you know, before before we can come up together and share more of the data to everyone here. Jennifer, anything else? For the well, I was just gonna say that you know. Um, and we're always talking about two things that are really connected. And one is obviously, you know, reproductive aging is related to fertility. It's the number of oocytes and the quality of oocytes that a woman has are directly related to whether or not she can reproduce. Um, but there's this other piece which gets lost and that's the equality portion. And, and really what that means is that, you know, because a woman goes through reproductive decline, menopause in the middle of her life, um, every aspect of her life is affected by this. And most importantly, her overall health, right? So going through menopause is probably the worst thing that can happen to a, a woman's body. Um, and so, you know, trying to understand what makes a good egg, what, what, what it is that allows um, one person to have healthy eggs until they're much older versus someone who ends up having like PCOS and um, issues when they're younger. Understanding those differences is what's gonna make, um, hopefully, make the difference for us to balance the scale, so to speak. Um, that's all I would say. I would also um, wanna remind everybody to join us next week around the same time. <laughs> we have two more fantastic speakers, Shang Wei. Yes, so uh, until then, uh, we will hope to see everyone again next week. Uh, on making productive longevity a reality. Uh, and if there's any more questions, we'll be happy to take them and answer them. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.